you'd go out in the mornings and you'd pick up the bodies to take them off to the morgues that had been killed the night before, whether it be uh, shot, stabbed or burnt. You lost friends, you lost people that were there with you, they were your buddies. That if he wasn't there, I was not protected. If I was not there, he was not protected. The Angolan Civil War and that time that the Cold War went hot in South Africa. We're going to talk about it on today's Hot Zone. This is the Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Hey folks, Chuck Holton here. Thanks for being a part of the Hot Zone. And I've got some really interesting interviews for you today from my recent trip to South Africa. Now, if you're like me, you probably don't know much about the Angolan Civil War. And that's understandable because it happened in Angola and it was a long time ago. Uh, But the Angolan Civil War went on for like 30 years and it was uh, actually a an outgrowth of the great contest that we call the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States. And so I want to talk about it a little bit today because while I was in South Africa, I got a chance to meet some really fascinating veterans of that war. Now, there are a lot of dynamics at play here because in South Africa today, the, almost the entire military is all black people. But there was a time when black people weren't really allowed to serve and it was almost all white people and the service was compulsory. And so uh, pre-1994, uh, for part of the Angolan Civil War, these veterans were the ones doing the fighting and they were doing it really on behalf of those of us that, take advantage today of the freedoms that we enjoy because uh, this was one point where the cold war was definitely very hot it was more of a fight between uh, the south africans and the cubans and the russians than it was between the south africans and the angolans or anything like that but it was part of this greater contest and i want to just let these guys speak And if you're a subscriber to the podcast, you're going to get access to an extended version of this, this today's show that is more than an hour, I think, of these guys uh, telling their stories. And it's fascinating to me to listen to old veterans tell what it was like in their war. And so I think you'll find it fascinating, too. Take a listen. My name is Jaap Lawrence. I served... uh with the 6th South African Infantry Battalion in the Angolan War, which we also refer to as the Border War. Uh, My mustering in the Infantry Battalion was a signaler, radio operator. So I used to carry the radio during patrols and my job was to establish constant communications with our uh, headquarters Um, the border war obviously was the longest war that South Africa was involved and under correction I'm speaking uh, the the longest war on the South African continent uh, from 1966 till 1989 when the hostilities ended with uh, resolution 434 Uh, implemented by the United uh, Nations. During the border war, uh, the the type of war we fought was a counter-insurgency war. So what the idea was is to stop insurgents uh, coming from the borders of Angola into Southwest Africa, which was at that stage under South African protectorate for 75 years after the First World War ended in 1918. So we were involved as national servicemen. We had no choice. Uh, We were conscripted into the uh, South African Defence Force and uh, we had to serve a total of uh, two years uh, um, 
service and then another two years that which was spread out over a 10-year period. Uh, so in total, most national servicemen served a total of 12 years in the um, 10 years in the citizens' force. And uh, 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 most of us that was not in permanent force duty uh, served in the citizens' force. During my time at the border, I lost uh, uh, some good friends of mine. In total, uh, during uh, that war, I lost four friends, which one was a, a, a close school friend of mine uh, that uh, we matriculated together. But like Job said, uh, we all did either one year or later on it became two years compulsory service. Uh, as national service and then afterwards you had to do uh, compulsory camps which you were called up for most of them were you were called up for three months to go to the border I did seven of those on the border uh, all of them three months uh, did some one month camps, camps as uh, in a training capacity where I was on a course to um, be promoted to another rank or to be in another mustering, whatever the case may be. But, uh, yeah, as I said, seven of them were on three months on the border. Uh, one of these occasions we were called up and we went to a place called Inano, which was just off like eight clicks from the borderline or the cop lane as it was referred to because it was a a road that was uh, cleaned up between the bushes and uh, we were then deployed into doing patrols all along this cut line. Uh, we were in a temporary base one night uh, at about 20 past 7. Uh, we were attacked. We were only 24 of us in this platoon and we were attacked by 45 of these uh, Swapu uh, terrorists uh, under the control of uh, Cuban officers which were shouting all the instructions to their troops. Um, one of my friends was, well one of my, my troops, I was a platoon sergeant at that stage, one of my uh, guys in my platoon got shot with an RPG um, and the RPG landed right next to him in his little foxhole uh, he was uh, Kazavakt, but he died later on in the hospital in Pretoria. Um, I, I was told when I, when I was doing my basic training at, at, at the officers college there um, that if the pawpaw hit the fan, we would be the first guys to be called up and lo and behold it was, you know, as citizen force guys. Mm. And everybody was citizen force, you know, and I mean, uh, I grew up in a town called East London on the, on the, on the, on the east coast of South Africa. Um, and when, when the regiment got called up, the whole of the, the town got called up, you know, I mean, that was it. Basically, the, you know, all the able-bodied men got called up, or, you know, at least seven, eight hundred of them at a time, and they took them up. My name is Johnny Sternkamp. Um, um, I started my basic training in 1971, uh, called up to the Army Gymnasium, officers, uh, on an officer's course, became a loot, um, and then come along 75, a coup in Portugal, um, and which necess necessitated then that the troops, all the Angolan troops, or the Portuguese troops that were in Angola and Mozambique had to be taken back to Portugal. Um, it left a void in, in Angola. Um, they had three liberation movements there, the MPLA, FNLA, and UNITA. Um, and then it was a free-for-all for these guys. MPLA picked up on the uh, Russians to back them. Um, we weren't too sure about the... Um, FNLA, uh, they sort of looked at the Russians and they looked at the Chinese, and UNITA also looked at the Chinese. But as things developed, and this is now November 1975, um, we sent in national servicemen, youngsters, 17 year old, went in as a mercenary column, they were called mercenary columns, um, neutral equipment, um, did their bits, and then they had to be relieved. Uh, uh, citizen force units like us were then called up. I'm Alan Baudry. I came up at the end of the war. I was called up to 7th South African Infantry Battalion. Um, I did my national service 87, 88, 89. 
as I got it to the end of, uh, of the uh, conflict, I uh, was, my mustard was in the stores. I never made it up to the actual border war itself. Um, after my national service, I was put out to citizen force, where we were then trained, as the uh, Sergeant Major was talking about, going into the townships. We did our camps in the townships. Um, we went mainly down to KwaZulu Natal, uh, with the faction fighting between the Encarta Freedom Front and the ANC in the Valley of a Thousand Hills and that we used to have to do foot patrols and that um, had to go out and assist after the uh, conflicts. Uh, the From being real soldiers in the bush, we became and had to become soldiers in township areas and that in its, on its own was quite a, quite a change as those around me will attest to. Um, <clears throat> we made it and because we were there we were managed to enforce a peaceful change politically within South Africa because we were there the, the mass murder I think is, is the best way to, to attribute what, what they were doing to each other uh, you'd go out in the mornings and you'd pick up the bodies to take them off to the morgues that had been killed the night before, whether it be uh, shot, stabbed, or burnt. Um, basically, you were doing uh, morgue duty. The bodies would be left in the road for you, you'd drive down, you'd pick them up uh, and remove them all from there. Uh, during the night, you try and maintain the peace, try and stop the factions. You lost friends, you lost people that were there with you, they were your buddies. The, if he wasn't there, I was not protected. If I was not there, he was not protected. Um, and, uh, you know, people say, well, what is it all worth? You know, and, and um, um, you know, as a soldier, I just had a look at the bigger picture, and I always said that, you know, I think we happened to crack Russia as well, because the armaments and the, the, all the equipment that was brought in and supplied to the, to the enemy in Angola, uh, we were wrapping it up, you know, uh, uh, flattening it, bringing the stuff back, blowing it up if we couldn't bring it back. And I think that input from the, from the Russians actually crippled them. They had the, the Cubans there as well. Uh, the Cubans were taking a hiding uh, because they didn't, just have, they didn't have enough uh, support from the local population. Once we uh, made those that are not with us anymore, we made a promise just as you guys in the U.S., uh, we made a promise that we will never forget them. And unfortunately, as the Sergeant Major <clears throat> noted, we are the last, we are the last line standing. We will be the last guys that remember those names that is, uh, that is indicated on our remembrance walls. Now, uh, being a veteran for once is remembering those guys that did not return with us. The second major thing is that once my life depended on the man next to me and his life depended on me. And all of that came to an abrupt end. Well, go, going forward, after, after 94, uh, there was no more conscription. So... From 94, the, the youngsters, and when we talk the youngsters, we're talking the guys 16, 17, 18, that used to be called up for, for their national service, haven't been called up. It's, it's now becoming a, um, like, like the World War II and World War I veterans, the forgotten generation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you see a movie about it or you hear someone talk about it, mm -hmm. but that was a long time ago. All those guys are old. Maybe it's your father. Um, yes, you know, and and, and now, at least it's, it's now all the, it's ninety percent of us are grandfathers, or very close to that. I mean, all the guys that were there have kids over the age of of, of twenty. Some of them are very very young, you know, but um, you know the the youth are not taking an interest in this part of the history. Um, and our government isn't 
portraying it in the, in the schools or, or, or putting it out there for to learn? <clears throat> to the best of my knowledge, Chuck, um, the South African Defence Force, National Defence Force, as it's now known, is going to <clears throat> make an announcement that all of the traditional regiments, names will be changed. So all the history and tradition and names, in fact, and in my regiment's case, 116 years of tradition, of uh, service to the world peace and stability will go who knows where. Um, I know what my regiment's name is going to be changed to. I know what a couple of others will be changed to. But What's the purpose of that? It, it's the, the, they want to get rid <clears throat> the current government wants to get rid of all colonial connection because of presumably what it means to the African psyche given the history of the continent and particularly of the last century um, <clears throat> so for those of us who have served in a traditional regiment and many of those traditional regiments have their roots in British regiments and in point of fact wear parts of their uniform and their tartan clothing and or headdress will all go by the board and all those people on all various headstones and cenotaphs <coughs> excuse me, will presumably be lost uh, to posterity and, and that is to us soldiers around this table quite a frightening thing because yes. we, we are the way, and I think I speak to for all of us here, that we're the last people standing to actually yes. keep on remembering yeah. those people who gave their all. All right, folks, I hope you found that as fascinating as I did. That's all I've got for today's podcast. Please like and share the podcast with your friends. We want this thing to grow and get out to more people. We're doing a lot of work to bring you some real first source information here. And this is today's podcast is exclusive content. It's something that you're not going to see anywhere else. So uh, let's support the podcast if you like. We really appreciate that on this end. And thank you for watching. I'm Chuck Holton. This has been The Hot Zone. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.